Oh yeah, cheers to some cheap wine and some much better fights. So, this weekend, we've got some fights coming up, guys. You realize this. Got some great fights going down from the UFC Apex this Saturday. Got UFC Vegas 68 slash UFC Fight Night 218 slash UFC Fight Night Lewis versus Spivak. So many names for these guys. We've got to cut down on these names. Uh, but most importantly, we've got the Road to UFC Finals going on. So I have been looking forward to this for almost a year now. Uh, I'll probably be the most excited person that you meet for this Saturday's fights, but that's okay. My job is to help you get there as well. So 12 fights going down from the UFC Apex this Saturday at a time that some people are not too happy about in case you haven't noticed. Uh, it starts at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, uh, which is one reason why everyone should move to the West Coast, hello. Uh, but that time is geared towards an Asian audience. So in South Korea, where the event was supposed to happen, uh, that's gonna be noon on Friday. So. Perfect timing for them to uh, kick off their afternoon, but a little tough for some of us in the US, but most fight cards are geared towards us anyway, so uh, what can you say? It's okay for us to have to uh, adjust or even just watch them back the next day. Uh, but I'm here to help you get into the spirit of these fights, to get to know some of these fighters. I am here to help you get a little bit more excited to stay up late and enjoy some amazing fights. So let's get into it. Uh, mostly just going to cover the Road to UFC fights, but I'll touch on some of the other ones that I'm looking forward to. Cheers. So Road to UFC has been going on for uh, eight months now. Uh, about you know last last spring, I heard from Mr. John Hyung Ko. Uh, who I get to work with in a professional capacity, uh, fortunately for me, that there would be this tournament, uh, kind of like Contender Series, but more you know tournament style, uh, featuring Asian fighters. And of course, that was right up my alley. I was really excited about that. I uh, started reaching out to some of the fighters that I was in touch with, uh, some of these Asian fighters, and several of them had been contacted. Fighters like Liu Kai, Yi Jia, Chiu Lun, a lot of the, mostly you know the Chinese fighters, but. I owe this tournament a lot to my professional career because this is what kind of helped me to build out my network across not just China, but a lot of other Asian countries as well. I ended up breaking almost every single one of the uh, original quarterfinal matchups, uh, which there were 16 fights overall, and I think I broke like 14 or 15 of those. Uh, I also was able to break the date and location for the semifinals, as well as confirm the semifinal matchups. Uh, so this this really was something that I dug into hard, and I was almost about to uh, go to the finals uh, when they're in Korea, but then things kind of got thrown up in the air, and they didn't take place in Korea, and that was mostly because of uh, Korean Zombie was supposed to headline the card, they had some trouble finding an opponent, and then he got injured, and then time just ran out, and they couldn't, you know, it's hard to find a replacement. There's rumor that he was going to retire at that fight. So they really wanted to build the fight card around him. Without him, there really wasn't anyone else that could headline on semi-short notice for Korea. So uh, they ended up just moving it to the apex, which is totally fine. So of course you got Derek Lewis versus Sergey Spivak in the main event. Uh, you got Jung Da-un versus Devin Clark in the co-main event. Also got Marcin Taibura versus Blagoy Ivanov. Got Choi Duho, the Korean Superboy, making his return against Kyle Nelson. Uh, I've got Dana White's Contender Series alum, Misaku Kinoshita, the first Japanese fighter to win on Dana White's Contender Series, win a contract, uh, fighting Adam Fugit, uh, who is a guy who trains not far from where I am located at. He's a he's an Oregon guy. Uh, trains with a gym called Art of War. We're skipping over the, U the road to UFC finals. You've also got uh, a pretty important fight between Kim ji versus Mandy Bohm. Uh, both of them are on some losing streaks and probably going to be a loser leaves town kind of fight. So I'm expecting these two to put on a great show. Uh, both are great fighters, just, uh, you know, fought a lot of uh, tough competition. And then you've also got Park Jun-yeon, the Iron Turtle, fighting Dennis Teololin. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that's like 
harder for me to pronounce than any of these uh, Asian names. And then opening up the card, you've got future flyweight contender, in my opinion, Tetsuro Tyra fighting Jesus Aguilar of Mexico. So lots of great fights with uh, Asian fighters. Uh, jumping into the Road to UFC fights. First up, you've got Park Hyung Sung versus Choi Sung Gook. Uh, this is a fight that's kind of flying under the radar. Uh, not uh, as much of a following behind these two fighters, but I think that both of them uh, could become pretty solid UFC flyweights. Uh, I think that they are still younger in their careers. You know, Park is 7-0, and oh, Choi is, what is he, 6-1? and one? Yeah, Choi is 6-1. and one. So um, both of these guys a little bit younger in their careers, got a lot of room to go, showed some promising things in their uh, quarter and semifinal fights in Road to UFC. Uh, I think that Park will probably take this one. This is probably the hardest one to pick out of all of the, out of all of the Road to UFC fights. This one is the one I struggled with the most to find a winner. Both guys overcame some pretty good competition in the semifinals. Uh, Park beat Top Noi Kiram in a very tough fight. Definitely got his bell rung a couple times, but was able to eventually get Top Noi to the ground and find the submission. A very tough fight, very impressive, beating Top Noi, who's a, a veteran of Ryzen. Uh, and then Choi Sung Gook is one of the guys that kind of like exceeded my expectations the most in the, the first two rounds of the tournament. Uh, he first fought. Uh, fight Rama Supandi, is that right? Yeah, he first fought Rama Supandi and then he fought uh, Chiu Lun after that. And Chiu Lun is a very tough guy, very fast, very explosive. So uh, a very good win for him as well. So Park is seven and oh, he's 27 years old. He trains at a gym called MMA Story. Uh, he's also been going to um, Red Horse, uh, Kim Kyung Pyo's gym, uh, Red Horse MMA, and getting some time in with him. Who's a, he's a great grappler. And he's also spent some time at Bong Tao MMA and Muay Thai over in Phuket, Thailand. Um, so he's, he is a solid guy. He's very efficient, uh, but very effective with his striking. He uh, is a really smart guy. He's got some great throws. Uh, where he really excels is on the ground. He's extremely crafty, really scrappy. Uh, he is very flexible. You could definitely see that in the fight with Top Noise. So, if the fight goes to the ground, I would probably give the advantage to Park, uh, although he could have a harder time getting it to the ground. He could um, he could try and set up some throws against Choi. Uh, Choi, so he is uh, he's 26 years old. He's been training at Korean Zombie MMA, so he's had Korean Zombie in his corner for these first two fights, and I think he has shown some pretty good improvement in between two, the two fights. Both these guys are a little bit small for flyweight, so they definitely have a lot of room to grow, to continue to fill out, which I expect them to. I mean, they're still, you know, within their first six, seven pro MMA fights, so they're gonna they're gonna keep filling out. Uh, but as of right now, I think that Choi is probably the more athletic of the two. He's pretty good with wrestling, he likes to, to uh, drag fights to the mat. Sort of his MO the last two fights has been uh, wrestling to the body, so a lot of more like Greco-Roman style wrestling. Uh, he's been able to drag his opponents to the ground. Unfortunately, once he's to the ground, he hasn't really been able to do much with it. So he'll get guys to the ground uh, with a lot of success, but then he just kind of sits there in top control. Uh, he hasn't really attempted a lot of submissions, and sometimes he'll try to go for some ground and pound, some elbows, but uh, has trouble advancing position is what I saw. So in the grappling, I would probably give this to Park. I think that he's a little bit more offensive and thinks you know a couple more steps ahead is able to make things happen a little bit more effectively than Choi. So uh, these two guys uh, matching up with each other, um, like I said, they're both a little bit small for flyweight, uh, Choi a little bit more athletic. Uh, I would say Choi is probably going to try and keep this on the feet and break Park down. Uh, he probably saw some areas of, uh, of that he could exploit in the grappling in uh, Park's fight with Top Noi. So I would expect, uh, you know, Choi's gonna try and blast those low kicks. He's gonna try and use his speed and his power uh, to hit Park with the jabs and maybe set up uh, some combinations. He hasn't been entirely fluid with his combinations thus far, so let's see if he is able to, uh, to do that a little bit more in this fight. 
uh, park, I expect him to try and close the distance and then drag uh, Choi to the ground and set up the submission. Uh, he looked, Park looked great in his first fight against Jeremiah Sirigar of Indonesia. Uh, his ground and pound look really solid. For a smaller guy, he hits pretty hard on the ground and has pretty, um, pretty stifling top control. So I lean Park on this fight. I think it'll probably go to a decision. I think that Park's gonna get the better of the scrambles. And I think overall, when you add up the control time, it's gonna go towards Park. So probably some clinch work in this fight. It's gonna be very close, very competitive. I think it'll be a decent scrap, but uh, lean slightly towards Park. So. Let's go to the next fight. Uh, next fight is a great fight. Uh, first fight was Korea versus Korea. Next fight is Japan versus Japan. So we got Toshioma Kazama versus Rinya Nakamura. A fight, uh, two fighters that have a lot of similarities, but also quite a few differences as well. So with Kazama, he is an incredible judoka uh, grappler. He is uh, awesome with the throws. He is extremely crafty. You think of like your typical like Japanese fighter being really crafty and intelligent on the ground. Kazama is totally in that mold. Kazama is 25 years old, trains at Wakajutsu Keishukai Hearts Gym, and, and he's got a 10 and two record. So five of those wins are by submission. Uh, he is more experienced than Rinyu Nakamura. He has spent more time developing his MMA game but uh, I think Nakamura is gonna have a lot of advantages. Nakamura is one of the most highly touted prospects of this whole tournament. He is 6-0, he's 27 years old, and uh, Nakamura, the advantage he has is he's super, super athletic, uh, but he is also going to use his wrestling as an advantage. So he is a U23 World Wrestling Champion in 2017, and he actually medaled in two different weight classes. And he was actually going to compete in the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, uh, but of course we know what happened there, canceled by COVID. Uh, and so he basically just retired on the spot and uh, decided to put all of his focus into MMA. So he was able to get a couple more fights. He hasn't been pro for that long at all, uh, but he's undefeated. And actually, despite being like a, a wrestler grappler, four of his six wins come by knockout, uh, standing on the feet. So uh, he's got like a head kick knockout that's really awesome. He is just like a powerhouse for bantamweight. Anytime you have a guy that didn't go pro that long ago and he is undefeated and has a lot of knockouts, like he, he has just been able to pick up the game very quickly. He's super athletic. And I think that he has a super high ceiling uh, between him and Lee Jung Young, I think those two have probably have the highest ceilings of anyone in this tournament. So Renia probably did actually get the easiest path to the finals. Uh, he submitted uh, Gugun Guzman in the first round, uh, in the opening round of the tournament, and then he fought Shohei Nose in the second round. Both got, uh, got first round finishes in both of those fights. He both had an easy path, but he looked really good and he didn't seem to struggle too much in either of those fights. He can get a little bit uh, wild in his striking. He's, he's been caught uh, in both of his fights against Guzman and against Nose. He got caught in the striking when he got a little bit wild. He was really aggressive. Uh, but uh, so he has to watch out for that. But man, this dude has got a freaking piston of a left hand. He shoots that straight down the pipe, fights from the southpaw stance, and just blasts that left hand. And uh, Shohei Noze was pretty tough. He wore a lot of damage and uh, was able to take a lot of those early shots. But uh, eventually, by the end of the round, just got worn down and was finished by punches from Nakamura. Yeah, he looks great. His wrestling is amazing. Um, he is probably going to get Kazama on his back uh, quite a bit in this fight. How I see this going, I would say Nakamura is probably going to uh, probably have his way on the feet and beat up Kazama quite a bit. I didn't see much in Kazama's striking that gave me much confidence that he was going to have any kind of advantage over Nakamura. There'll probably be some sloppy exchanges on the feet, but I think Nakamura is going to get the, um, the advantage of that. Uh, definitely Kazama's going to try and tie up as soon as possible and hit a throw to get Nakamura on the ground. But uh, with Nakamura, you know, you might think that ordinarily Kazama, even if they're on the ground, he may have some kind of advantage. But the way that I saw Nakamura wrestle, 
you know, so he was, um, when he would take people to the ground, he would always take people down into side control. So that tells me that against someone like Kazama, he's going to be able to take Kazama down and nullify any kind of advantages that Kazama would have off his back uh, with submissions. So, you know, he was he was really good at the crucifix position. He submitted Gugun Guzman with a key lock in their first fight in the first round of the tournament. So uh, he's really good uh, with uh, taking people down into a position that he's advantageous off the bat rather than, uh, you know, into the into the guard where he has to work forward. So I would expect this to probably go to the decision. I think that uh, Nakamura is going to be able to score and probably win every single round, but uh, Kazama is, is, is a really tough guy. You might see a late finish in this fight uh, by TKO, uh, you know, late round two and, or into round three, but I would think that, uh, I would think that uh, this is going to be Nakamura's fight to win. He's going to be such an exciting prospect to have in the UFC Bantamweight division. Sheesh, such a, such a high ceiling on this guy. So the, uh, the next fight is our lone Chinese fighter, Yi Jia versus Li Jung Young. Uh, Li Jung Young might have the, uh, the other guy I mentioned saying that he may have the highest ceiling of anyone in, um, in this tournament. He's looked like a total beast so far. He's always a huge favorite in all of his fights. And I think that he deserves to be the favorite, but I'm, I'm still not totally sold on the guy. Anytime someone is winning fights by a quick knockout, very impressive, but you always have to go back and look at their fights where they went the distance to see what other ways were they tested or and when they fought someone who was really skilled and able to avoid that knockout shot, uh, what kind of offense were they able to land? So I went back and looked at some of his fights. He's an athletic freak. Like he's, he's a freak of nature. Uh, he's, he's just someone that's got some good genes and builds a uh, great body type and is going to be able to knock people out with, with one shot. You know, he's got this really long, like, bladed stance, and he is able to um, to shoot that right hand right down the pocket, and he he doesn't just, like, wear guys down, he puts them out cold. Uh, his fight before Road to UFC, uh, his his uh, fight, he won that in 10 seconds. And then, you know, he submitted Shea Bean with an arm bar in the first round, and then he put out Liu Kai, who I think very highly of, uh, he was able to defeat Liu Kai in the semifinals with, with somewhat ease. Um, so that was pretty surprising. A lot of people are very high on him. Uh, what I saw on Lee Jung Young is that with that bladed stance, he can tend to leave his, his hands pretty far apart and he can actually take quite a bit of damage and leave himself open quite a bit uh, when he, more of these back and, and forth exchanges. So he does have to be careful of that uh, if he's fighting someone that knows, that is well prepared for him, knows what they're doing. Uh, so watch for that. And also sometimes with his striking, with that bladed stance, he can uh, leave his leg, his front leg open both for the leg kick and also for the takedown, which that is where I could see Ija finding his game plan and building it around that. So. Uh, with Ija, so Ija is, he's 26 years old, he's 21 and three. He's the most experienced guy that's still in the finals right now. He comes from the Unbo Fight Club gym in Chengdu, uh, Sichuan, China. Uh, the gym that has produced the most UFC fighters from China. Um, so definitely uh, those guys are always trouble. Uh, he also, in his last fight, he trained at Bali MMA. And he's also trained a lot at the Shanghai PI. Uh, that's where he trained for this fight as well. So, you know, they're probably well aware of Lee Jung Young's strengths. And you know that like, right off the bat, Yi Jia is going to try and take this to the mat as soon as possible. He's gonna try and put some weight on Lee Jung Young, wear him out, uh, eventually take his back and go for that submissions. So Yi Jia, he's got a great top game. He's got great submissions. His sweet spot is the back. He's got a lot of finishes by rear naked choke. He is so, so good at dragging guys down to the mat, taking their back, submitting him. So watch for in this fight, you're gonna have to watch and see is Ija able to, uh, you know, basically withstand uh, some heavy strikes on route to be able to take Lee Jung Young to the ground and work for the submission. 
I think if I'm predicting this fight, I think that Lee will probably win this fight. I think it'll probably go a little bit longer than his last two fights. Uh, I would think probably like late round one uh, knockout or an early second round knockout. Uh, but Ija is very experienced. He's fought a lot of different looks. Uh, he's beaten a lot of really good guys and he's only lost to top competition. So he's gonna come prepared. I don't think that, you know, it's like last fight, Lukai. Lukai has, I think like 11 or 12 fights going into that fight. Uh, Ija has twice as many. So he's a lot more experienced. I don't think that this is gonna be a blowout fight like the last fight was for Lee Jung Young, um, but I still I do still expect Lee to win. Uh, but both these guys are going to be great in the UFC. Uh, I expect them both to have really long futures. Uh, but yeah, look for that. Uh, look to see how Ejaw tries to close the distance. That's what uh, that's what I would look for in this fight. And then finally, we've got uh, man, what a freaking fight this is, guys. You're, you're going to want to make sure you uh, tune into these prelims just for this fight. Um, Jekka Sarji versus Anshul Jubli. I'm not sure how to say that. Sargi, Sarji. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Um, these guys, each of these guys are already more popular than most of the fighters on the UFC roster. You know, everyone's complaining about this card saying like that they don't know who these fighters are. They're a bunch of scrubs. But guys like these two fighters are carrying two of the most populated countries in the world. So Anshul Jubli coming from India, he is by far the most popular Indian fighter and he's just getting started. He's only six and oh. Think of what this guy's gonna be like in a couple years. Uh, he's gonna carry all of India on his back. Indian MMA, if you guys don't know, is like booming right now. It is one of the fastest growing markets. The the other fastly growing market, I would say right now, is Indonesian MMA, which Jekka Sarji represents. Uh, so this is, this is a massive fight. This is a highly important fight for Asian MMA and the most important fight that has ever happened for Indonesian or Indian MMA. Both these guys have been getting a lot of press in their home countries, very, very well supported. Uh, Sarji, like you go around Indonesia, Jakarta, his picture is everywhere. His uh, videos featuring him are all over uh, billboards. He's all over, he's like a superstar already. He hasn't even fought once in the UFC. So this guy's gonna blow up, uh, you know, Indonesia, fourth most populated country in the world. India, second, maybe first. Uh, last time I checked, second most populated country in the world. And just think like the UFC has not really tapped these markets yet. They These countries have not produced fighters that can really like bring in the entire country in as a fan base. So these are two, I cannot stress the importance of this fight for these two markets and for the UFC to grow worldwide. These guys are gonna come in and then Road UFC is gonna come back later this year and the floodgates are gonna open for more fighters like these. There's, there are, there's more out there. These are not gonna be one and done uh, fighters for their markets. There are more good fighters coming up. Uh, some uh with as much potential if not more so uh let's get into the fight so um jekka is he's 13 and 2 he's 28 years old so he is um a pretty big lightweight i would say i could i could definitely see him moving up to welterweight at some point in his career as he as he bulks up a little bit uh he has been training in san diego at the gym called studio 540 uh, he's been training with a guy named Mark Fiore, who uh, that's kind of a blast from the past name because he used to coach at, um, what was that gym in Iowa that was really big? Oh, it was Militich gym, uh, um, Militich's gym. So yeah, he used to train a lot of really good UFC fighters back in like the late 90s, early 2000s. And so I guess he's in San Diego now. He's been working with guys like Jekka and helping, uh, helping to polish up his game. So going into Jekka's first fight against Pawan Man Singh, uh, he showed some good things. He also showed some, uh, some holes in his game. Uh, I, I hold those against him, but what 
interests me most about looking at Jekka Sarge to see how actually good is this guy or how good is his ceiling is comparing the two fights um, between that one between Pawan versus his second one versus Kiwan Bean. And the fight with Kiwan Bean wasn't a super long fight, but he did show a lot of improvements in that fight. He showed uh, he was much tighter with his striking. Uh, he looked to be in much physically better shape. And I'm sure they probably, I, I know, uh, I know this, I'm not guessing, but I, I know that he worked a lot on his wrestling for that fight with Q on Bean as well. Undoubtedly working a lot on his wrestling for this fight as well. So his striking is pretty, he, he's a really aggressive guy. He tends to lunge forward a lot and just like wind up and throw just like grand slam home run shots a lot. and and. It works for him. I mean, that's what he was able to take out Kiwan Bean with. Uh, that's a that's a really good name to beat, by the way. That's that's a really impressive name uh, to have a win over. So, got a lot of like really like innate uh, power, and once it's cultivated, it's just going to get scarier and scarier. Jubilee's probably going to take some big shots in this fight. He's gonna he's gonna have to recover. He may get uh, he may get tagged a couple times. So look for that. His fight with with Pawan, we got to see his uh, his grappling a little bit, and it was okay. There was a lot to be desired. He he was in control, but it was somewhat loose. Uh, it didn't it didn't seem like there was a lot of direction. So I'm sure they've worked on that a lot in, uh, in the last year living in San Diego. I'm not necessarily expecting the same out of him in that area. I think it's probably going to be a lot better. Jekka seems like the kind of guy that learns really quickly. I remember them saying on the broadcast that Mark Fiore um, was excited to work with someone like Jekka in San Diego because he was really like a blank slate. So I think that um, you're going to see a lot of improvement out of Jekka if he does get signed to the UFC after this fight, which he should. I, I can pretty much guarantee you that win or lose, he's going to get signed. I hope that they are able to give him some, you know, bring him along slowly, give him some lower level fights, let him keep developing. Uh, instead of just like shooting him up the rank. So uh, his opponent, Anshul Jubilee, is only six and O oh, guys, only six fights. He's the least experienced of all the fighters in the finals, which I don't say that is a knock, actually just the opposite. The fact that he is able to look so good and be in this position after just six fights tells you something about this guy's ceiling. It's very impressive. Uh, so with him, uh, he fights out of Soma Fight Club in Bali, Indonesia, which is a gym that is coming up fast, guys. Uh, Bali is, uh, you think about like your centers of Asian MMA in terms of training. Uh, your first one that comes to mind is uh, Phuket. Uh, you've also got Singapore in there with Evolve MMA uh, and a lot of other great gyms. Uh, but guys, Bali is definitely up there with, uh, you got Bali MMA and now Soma Fight Club. They've got a lot of really good fighters coming up the ranks. So, uh, great place to be training. What impressed me about uh, Anshul is that he didn't get to fight uh, the quarterfinals round, which I thought was gonna be a big knock against him against Red Horse, Kim Kyung Pyo. Uh, but man, he handled himself like a pro in that fight. Kim is such a good name, guys. And I thought that Anshul just like, I thought he looked like such a professional, gave such good account of himself, looked just like he is close to ready for the UFC, despite coming from a, a developing market like India and only having going into that fight with five fights. Super impressive guy. You listen to interviews with Anshul and he's just so confident, so composed. And I just, I know this guy's gonna be another big star in the UFC someday, just like Jekka will. Uh, both these guys, just so excited to see how far they can go. Uh, but yeah, uh, Anshul, he came up, uh, a lot of his fights coming through Matrix Fight Night, which is developing the crap out of Indian MMA right now, guys. Good Lord, are those guys doing it the right way. Anshul getting his experience through Matrix Fight Night is a very good sign. He fought some pretty good guys, uh, the best that I think were available to him, even young in his career. In those fights, there wasn't a whole lot to take away from them. Uh, you know, some good top control, good ground and pound. Uh, but in his fight with Kim, which, by the way, guys, he fought that fight with a broken toe. 
uh, small part of your body, but think about how much weight and how much you depend on your big toe when you're moving forward and fighting. And Anshul has a very aggressive striking style. He moves forward a lot, lots of high volume. Uh, he, the fact that he was able to win that fight despite having a broken toe just tells you something not about his grit and resolve, but also about his skill level as well. So can't say enough good things about this guy at where he's at in his career. Uh, he's got incredible shot placement. He mixes things up really, really well. Uh, he's got a pretty good ground game, a good top game. Uh, Kim was not able to get him onto his back at all in that fight, which Kim is a BJJ black belt. Uh, I think a lot of people thought that he was going to submit Anshul, but um, you know, Anshul was able to keep things on the feet and uh, just land more volume than Kim, uh, land the better shots. And so highly impressive fight. I am expecting from this fight, this is another, a pretty tough fight to call. I'm leaning towards Anshul Jubilee, but uh, you never know with Jekka's power, with uh, how fast he's improving. I know I'm pissing off a lot of Indonesian fans by saying that I'm picking Anshul, but definitely not counting Jekka out. I personally see this fight going to a decision. I think that overall, you're gonna see Anshul land the cleaner strikes and probably in a little bit higher volume. But man, watch out for Jekka and his power shots. Um, he's gonna go for those kill shots against Anshul. I would think that Anshul's probably gonna wanna take him to the mat and uh, use his jujitsu jiu there and, uh, and try to wear Jekka out. Uh, just a guess there. Um, but uh, he'll probably land some pretty key takedowns on the way to a decision. Gonna be a close fight. I expect it to probably win like fight of the night. Um, it's just like two, those two styles are just so perfectly made for a great fight. Two really aggressive guys, both want it so bad. Almost like, I know it's a little bit like um, projecting to say that this is gonna be like a Griffin Bonner, but for Asian MMA, but it really is like such an important fight. And I don't know when we're going to have another fight or when the last time we had a fight that was like so important to two markets like this. And with two guys that just won it so badly, I think that it's gonna produce a crazy fight. So highly looking forward to it. But yeah, so definitely looking forward to uh, this event as a whole. Um, you know, Derek Lewis in the main event should be fun. Not really sure who to pick in that fight, uh, but I am really looking forward to seeing Yusaku Kinoshita uh, fight. He is one of those like really young Japanese guys. Dude, what is the deal with all these like super young Japanese fighters just like flooding into the UFC. That is just like such a dark horse story going on right now of just like, you got Tetsuro Taira, you got uh, Yusaku Kinoshita, um, you got Rinya Nakamura and Kazama Toshiomi, and they're all like 20, 21, 22 years old. Uh, really looking forward to that. Tetsuro Taira is definitely one of those guys. So um, I will be giving a lot more coverage for uh, Road to UFC Finals and the UFC Fight Night as a whole. Really excited to cover it. Um, so make sure you subscribe. Uh, make sure you follow me on Instagram, MMA Ecosystem, on Twitter, same thing, MMA Ecosystem across all platforms. I'm gonna give you the scoop on what's coming up uh, with Road to UFC in the future. So I've heard from several people that are pretty close to the situation that are uh, that either work for the UFC or are managers that Road to UFC is coming back, most likely July or August of 2023. I have heard that in addition to all the same weight classes, that they're also going to have welterweight, they're going to have uh, all the women's weight classes, which kind of surprises me because Bantamweight is not really a division I think of for women in Asia, is there being a lot of talent right now, uh, definitely like atom weight through flyweight, but you know, we'll see. So. That's definitely not final. That's no announcement that that could definitely change. But uh, Road to UFC was such a success this year, uh, produced a ton of great fighters that are going to go pretty far in the UFC. And it just makes sense that they're going to do it again and expand it even further. Uh, not fair to exclude the women's divisions here. So uh, excited to see all the great talent that's going to come up. Uh, I am going to have some special involvements with uh, Road to UFC this year. Can't say exactly how yet, but uh, this past year, uh, definitely from the media side, breaking the fights, I was all over that. Uh, I may get into some of that this year, but uh, I 
am going to be connected to Road to UFC in some other pretty exciting ways, hopefully. Stay tuned to this space and we'll talk to you after the fights.